Welcome everyone to a new episode of Tales of the 2S LGBTQ+. My name is Douglas Parsons. I grew up in a small village of 172 people, Botha, Alberta, southeast of Red Deer. Now, growing up in that small village, I was extremely blessed. There were kids galore to play with and everyone's backyard belonged to us. My parents took advantage of that because on Saturdays, before I could even eat breakfast, they pushed me out the door, locked it, yelled out the window for me to go find somebody to play with, get fed by their parents, and maybe come home by supper. But dad would allow me to sneak in three o'clock in the afternoon every Saturday because that was our time to watch Stampede Wrestling. Ed Whalen would say it's another ring-a-ding-dong dandy. There would be an Irish whip into the turnbuckles. And of course, there's going to be a malfunction at the junction. And I grew up with the Owen Harts, the Muckasings, the Great Gamas, the Lethal Larry Cameron of the world. And it was everything. And I didn't realize until later that Calgary was the spot for true wrestling different styles, high flying, etc. Now I mention all of this because today's guest is Randy Myers. Ravenous Randy Myers. The weirdo hero Ravenous Randy Myers. He's been a vet of the squared circle for 20 years now. He grew up in Calgary and it was the next wave of Stampede Wrestling where he got his start. We're gonna talk about 20 years of being in the wrestling ring, how he's part of our fantastic rainbow community, mental health, so much more. And I've heard over and over again that Randy may just be one of the nicest people in the industry. No pressure on him, of course. Now, before I bring Randy to the screen, as well as your ears, I wanna make mention just a few things. Tales of the 2S LGBTQ Plus is a weekly video and audio podcast that showcases the remarkable people found within our community. And it's by listening to their stories, which are our stories, we gain insight and understanding and especially connection so let's continue to do this on a weekly basis. If you're here for the first time because you love Randy, like I do, welcome. Please check out some previous episodes. Find out more about the community. Reach out to me if there's something that you're curious about. I'm really confident that we've covered it so far in the past year since we've started. It's stories. I become smitten with people every single week. And I hope you stick around to do that. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Press subscribe here on YouTube. Word of mouth is great. If you love Randy, pass on word. Send it to people. Make sure you get the story out. And I appreciate. Now, before all of this, I'm based here in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And it's important for me to say that as I'd like to acknowledge that I am living within Treaty 6 territory and within the Métis homelands and Métis nation of Alberta, Region 4. This is a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place and traveling route to the Cree, Sado, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. I acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. I am grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today and those who have come before. I continue to open myself up to learn, to listen, and to understand. I'm here to learn truth. I make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those on whose territory we reside. Today on Tales of the 2S LGBTQ Plus is the weirdo hero, Ravenous Randy Myers. And it's now time to bring him up on your screen and or your listening ears. 
Welcome to the podcast, Randy. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is fantastic. Yeah, this is great. We've chatted briefly before, and I may mention a little bit about what we want to talk about, but it's great just to be able to talk about wrestling and the art of it. A lot of people are like, ah, it's just fake. There's so much more to that. Definitely, for sure. It's a lot a blend of storytelling and theatrics and athleticism and improv and comedy and all of my favorite things wrapped up into one gigantic lovely bowl. It definitely is that. Before we get into the wrestling, we have to establish your street credibility. How are you connected to this rainbow community? Oh, geez. In so many, very many ways. I myself identify as pansexual. I'm, I love everybody and I find all sorts of people attractive. And I've always been that way. I could come out twice in my life. I came out once in high school to my friends and they were, they didn't like see me. They didn't even shrug or bat an eye about it. I think they knew what was coming. And then years later I was in, I came out as bisexual in high school and then ended up being in like a heterosexual relationship for quite a while. And my friends group changed. So I came out to this friend group and then was in a heterosexual relationship for so long that I just... It hadn't been brought up within my, the wrestling community. So then I came out a second time within the wrestling community. That's where I stand there as well for like how I identify. And then I was also raised by um, my single mother as well as her friends who are a group of fantastic gay males out of Calgary who like really helped me become who I am in so many different ways and allowed me to explore myself artistically and just not be stuck into the box. So I've always felt like I was raised to be part of this community. So you grew up in Calgary, not Kalamazoo, Michigan, much mm -hmm. to my disappointment. Yeah, the, an inside thing that we're saying here. Now, when you were growing up there, late 1990s is high school time for you. Was the term pansexuality even remotely part of a person's mind? Was it out there at that time? It wasn't part of my mind, at least in my, like, the zeitgeist of, like you said, like late 1990s, Alberta high school, maybe in other ones, but not where I was at least. So yeah, the term bisexuality just felt like it was a fit to me at that time. We hadn't talked as much about gender and stuff like that. I hadn't been explored as much, at least in my uh, small world. So that fit at that moment. Um, and bisexuality still has that stigma to it. Myself growing up, you were lesbian, you were gay, and bisexuality was a phase. It was a way for you to just test some waters. And I would imagine in Calgary that you got some of that pushback a little bit when it came to that. No, oh, definitely did. Yeah, for sure. There was a, the, yeah, the, just a phase or whatever. And I think that was part of the reason that some of my friends originally just shrugged it off was they were like, they just, this is something that's going to come and go or just something that he's like experimenting with right now. But again, like I also said that I don't think that any of them were, they were that shocked by it. I've always had my diverse friend group, people that were on the outside of society and kind of people that were some other people, like some might consider themselves misfits. Some other people might not like that term, but like the uh, island of misfit toys, just the outsider group. And so it was never a big thing, but it was definitely that feeling. Definitely. Yeah, I started giggling inside myself here because my friends group, we do call ourselves the misfits. So this fits in perfectly with that. I'm like, yeah, we're all misfits here. Totally. Uh, yeah. Talk about some of these friends of your mom that kind of shaped the way for you. Give them some street cred and credit as far as their influence on you. My godfather was one of these delightful men who basically really stepped up as the main like uh, father figure for me. I would go to his place after school and stuff like that and he would give me peanut butter and crackers and we'd go to the video store and get around whatever I wanted he was the one who would like read me books when I was little and but also was at that same time his place was like a hub for this group of friends and so I would be there when they were getting ready for drag parties or celebrating somebody's anniversary or somebody bringing over their no, new bow or whatever and because I was the only male or like the only child. I was just part of this. And I was part of this wild world. Obviously things were held back for me, but like I was also shown a lot more than a lot of people were. And from a very young age, like even some of the movies we're watching, like 
brought your picture show and stuff like that was shown to me like at four years old. It's like one of the first things I remember seeing, just always having things that were akin to more that the rainbow culture and always just seeing how much joy that camaraderie brought and just the outpouring of love that I got as the one child because there weren't necessarily that many other children in these people's lives and so many of them wanted children and that was a time when they didn't have uh, necessarily as many opportunities to have them as they do today so I got to be a surrogate child and man I just got spoiled rotten all the time and got to be around these ridiculously funny authentic people and that really has always been like a strong chord within me it's that chosen family. It's a common story that we share here on the podcast that misfits find themselves with other people. You recognize the commonality and you love each other no matter what. And ah, you were lucky. You were blessed. Totally. For sure. Because I'm thinking of the one or two kids that are in our lives that and they're just doted upon and spoiled to death. And you're just thinking, ah. How great to get that experience. Oh, totally. And that's actually, that's totally what's warped me in the best of ways to what I am today. Being like that, being like such a show person and wanting to be like having that in me to entertain and put on like a song and dance because they would cheer and applaud me. And I would get strokes for being like the, the silly one doing a puppet show or doing a dance or doing my latest impression or whatever I could, because I was always happy to punch up to their humor. They were always so funny that I had to, I knew I could get a laugh out of them. That was like the biggest thing for me, like the biggest gold coin I could get. There's a little bit of cattiness in there. And I can totally see it when you're doing your intros about yourself and boosting yourself up that you can cut a person. And you can learn that within the community as well, because we've got claws when needed. So that like playfulness that goes along with that too. You know what I mean? Like, I think, unfortunately, we build up such a fix and are forced to and sometimes because of where we've grown up or just like cultural norms as they were. And hopefully they're changing. They still are, unfortunately, as the people suffering all the time. But we build up stronger, thicker skin, which make us that ready for the claws to come out and a little bit like... It, it, when it's playful, it's so cathartic. I, get, I think of the times when I don't know somebody in a situation where I'm not feeling comfortable and somebody will come up to me and I'll let out the snark or the sassiness and then I'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry. That's just a, that's just me protecting myself a bit. You know, just give me a second. I'll warm up in a little bit and we'll be good. Totally. Yeah. Now, in this conversation, there's going to be some name dropping of wrestlers and there's going to be maybe some terms that our audience may not understand. So there'll be some inside stuff here and maybe one day we'll talk about it. Now, Randy, for the people who know you from before or who are watching you here right now, they might not know anything about wrestling, but they'll know a Hulk Hogan, a Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock. And they are muscle bound. They are larger than life. And they might be looking at the weirdo hero here and going, he's a wrestler? When you were growing up, were you an athletic child? No, not at all. I was not interested in sports. I'm still not all that interested in sports, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I, was, I got out of phys ed, actually, by writing essays the whole time. So the, all my physical, like, attributes have come later in life or come after in during my 20 year wrestling career basically the idea of becoming competitive or like wanting to beat my neighbor for some sort of arbitrary reason to be better than joe sport never intrigued me and in, it always felt like it was very machine not necessarily an individual based thing it was very much judged on these very strict elements and not until I found the punk rock elements of professional wrestling did I see the worth in um, and the place where you could be not only athletic and uh, healthy um, and taking care of yourself, but then also having that strong individuality and that strong place to be yourself and unlike anyone else and inspire people to not necessarily be the next person who can be a machine or whatever, but be their own a unique individual self and be that not only 
physically, but mentally and spiritually, the whole character wise and stuff like that. Really express yourself to the full nine or 10 or 11, 13. Whatever you can, whatever level you can hit is good. So you're a drama kid. That's what I'm hearing. You're a drama mm -hmm. kid. And so how does a drama kid all of a sudden then show up in high school at a training camp for youth who want to get into professional wrestling? I started going to the, like you said earlier, that Stampede Wrestling had a rebirth in 1999 and started off with a huge bang. They were doing shows at the Pavilion in Calgary on the Stampede grounds. And it was like selling out. And we went, I went with my best friend at the time and we, I was just blown away. I was already like enamored and in love with WWE, WWF at the time, WCW and ECW and all the kind of bigger leagues that were coming from the States. But this was something that was like homegrown and that was like right there. And these people seemed so accessible and so real. This seemed doable where, like you said, when you were mentioning earlier, the Stone Colds, the Rocks, the, the Hulk Hogan's, those all seemed awesome. But they seemed almost like the same way I look at a Marvel superhero where it's, that's cool. I'm not sure if I can do that or if that's even humanly possible or if you need to be like beamed down from Krypton or something. So seeing the Calgary-based people, seeing the people who maybe were younger and on their way up, some of the like people that were like my age was what really like hooked me. And then I would go to the shows and then, which were Friday, and then the Saturday morning was they'd re-show the show from last week. So I would go and try and still re-watch the show again because I was obsessed, try and see if I could see myself in the audience, all that kind of stuff. And then during the commercial break, there was commercials for Ted Hart's Pro Wrestling Camp, which was at the time the only pro wrestling camp that was for people under the age of 18. So it was if you weren't old enough to be in the dungeon, there was this other opportunity for you. So these commercials came on. I got kicked out of drama class for being a little too rowdy and being a little too obsessed with wrestling. My mom said, put your money where your mouth is, like drama was your thing. What are you going to do now? And then it was in, if this was like a TV show, it would be at that moment I turned on the TV and Ted Hart's face popped up and it was like, do you think you have what it takes to be a professional wrestler? And then, yeah, I go down to BJ's gym uh, in Calgary, which was, yeah, in the not the greatest thing neighborhood but a neighborhood i was also quite familiar with and yeah that was where i broke my teeth in many ways i'm going to go back a little bit because there will be people who are not familiar with wrestling calgary is well known for stampede wrestling the hart family bret hart owen hart others who are connected like davy boy smith the dynamite kid jim nyhart this huge family with Stu hart and then Teddy Hart is part of that family as well, the next wave. So you show up at this training camp and how many other kids are in this group with you? Oh, that's a good question. At that time, I think there was probably 10 to 12 kids that would rotate around. Like they weren't necessarily coming to every practice. It wasn't like your standard sports practice where we have a certain amount that we need to be there every time and kind of you're like drafted to a team or anything like that. So it was like people would come and go and it was had much more like uh, artistic or like like a playground kind of feel. You know what I mean? If you were there, if not after school program almost. But yeah, watching these kids right off the bat, they were doing these phenomenal things because they were had been going for years and maybe had been gymnasts before or whatever. So they were doing all these phenomenal moves and I was getting gassed hitting the ropes three times. Writing essays did not give me good cardio. So it's finding how that works. Who could have thunk it, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. I could write about cardio, but shy, yeah. doing it, no. <laughs> yeah. As a kid going into this world, were you then open about what you were calling yourself at that time, being bisexual? Was that something that you were open about? Or was that something where you went, oh, wrestling, I'm going to hide it a little bit more? Oh, for sure. I definitely, like I said, I already come out to my friend group at that time, but I didn't establish myself that way right off the bat within wrestling. I didn't establish myself as who I was much at all when I got into wrestling. I've always had like stupid colored hair. Since I was like 13, I started dyeing my hair. And then at that point I was like, nope, I let it go brown for like the only time like in recent memory, last 30 years ugh, or whatever, close to. And so I, and I was wearing different clothes. I didn't know how to be sport. So I was wearing track clothes. And all I had before that was like 
ripped denim and I couldn't wear that to wrestle in and to go to training. And so I had to get basically from like from replacing my Doc Martens with Adidas and with replacing my ripped jeans with some sort of track pants and replacing my wild hair with like just a brown, horrible haircut. I just hid in the background and like, I'm very loud normally and take up a room. But in that point, I also know when to step back and I was the say less and listen more mentality. I knew that I had no, the only way I could make any like stake in the game was to be not be loud, not be obnoxious, not turn these people off with anything. Uh, and I don't mean loud or obnoxious was what people would consider bisexual or whatever, but I just didn't want to open myself up to be that vulnerable because I already felt like I was doing that within the ring with showing my vulnerabilities and not being an athlete. And to put this into context with 1999, 2000, when you started your training in Alberta and Canada, it wasn't until 1998 with the Delwyn Breen case when the Supreme Court of Canada said that you could not be fired based on your sexuality. So this is one year, two years removed from if you were open, you could lose your professional job. So here's the climate. Plus, we also had a premier at that time who kept saying that they were going to use the notwithstanding clause and make it that being gay, being part of the rainbow community was a terrible thing. So this is the time frame. And that was only 21, 22 years ago, which is scary when you think about it. Really is. And like I said, I, I was so fortunate to grow up around the people I was, I grew up around, but they had all dealt with that and were all shell shocked from that. Some of them themselves had lost jobs. Some of the people that mattered to me most had, had lost a lot by just not even by being outed or not even not necessarily even being open about who they were, but it coming out through things or whatever. Ridiculous things where some of them would be getting pornography sent to their house. And then all of a sudden you've got the government coming and knocking on doors and stuff like that, like ridiculous things. So they were, there was such a level of secretiveness that was unfortunately brought up around where I was like, sometimes they'd be so loud and they were going out to the designated places where they were allowed to be themselves. But there was also so much of that hidden stuff where the majority of them were going to work, not being allowed to be open, not being yeah. allowed to be. Not open. being their authentic self. Yeah. hundred percent. Hey, how, from your first day of training until your first match, what was the time frame in between? How long was that until your first match? I think it was about, it was like just over a year. I started training in 2000 and then my first match was in 2001 in July. So it was like just over a year, I think. Do you remember who your first match was with? hundred percent. I wrestled against a guy at the time he was going by Adam Lust, but now he was like, now he's like, he went by Hannibal after that. Now I think he's the blood hunter, Devin oh, Nicholson. That's a different story later on. <laughs> I got time, but yeah, we actually have quite a tied history due to like that match. And then also going to WWE tryouts together and stuff like not knowing we were going to be at the same place at the same time. And the amount of times we've ran into each other is ridiculous, but he was my first match. It was a, I think it was him and a partner who the storyline was that his partner turned on him at the beginning of the match and versus me and three of my partners. So it ended up being like a Four, five on one match versus Adam Lust. And he was basically, he was a Canadian champion, a uh, wrestling champion and quite large. Like he was 17 and bigger than at least three of us in the match put together. And so he was just like annihilating us. It was basically a glorified squash match. The word I think would be, he's quite thick. Yes, he's thick. Like, yes, definitely. With thick two man at whatever age he has been at. That's for sure. Definitely, so yeah. So the first match then didn't scare you away from this because you're now 20 years into it. So what is it about professional wrestling that has just kept you going? That's a good question. And one I asked myself many times, um, there's so much to professional wrestling. Like we said, it is like an art form. It, it's such a complicated art form where, and not to take away from any other parts, of course, but like you have to stay physically fit. So your diet is a big part of it. So it adds a level of discipline where not only is your diet involved, not only are you going to the gym all the time, not only are you needing to work on your acting skills, as well as like thinking of new moves, thinking of new outfits, thinking of like songs and promos and so being intense, being funny, showing your pain, which is something that 
very few places actually are you allowed to show any sort of pain and are you cheered for it most places like will show you and rightfully so and fantastically show the audience all any pain they automatically give you too much sympathy and they almost feel like it's not a show anymore where in wrestling the idea of somebody getting knocked down and coming back from it it's so metaphorical about life in general like the stages of a wrestling match are very much struggles that we go through in life and I feel that it, there's just so many different ways I could put it, but it's cathartic too. The, like being able to, I suffer from mental health issues and I have for a long time. When I first got into wrestling, I said I was very rambunctious and got kicked out of drama class, but that was also with a lot of grief and a lot of pain at that time too, because I didn't know where to put all that energy. And it was coming out of the wrong places and it was leading me down some paths that I didn't want to go down just because I needed somewhere to be that wild, intense, and I didn't know where to put it. And then once I found wrestling and how hard I had to work to be a wrestler and how much I had to put into it, how much focus um, and discipline it taught me, then it made me able to step away from the places, the bad places and actually have a place to like, oddly enough, self harm i wanted to hurt myself and professional wrestling is a place where it's, you it's controlled you know what i mean it was still having that same outlet of the idea of punching a hole in the wall toxic masculinity taking over and punching a hole in some drywall or getting to a place where you're doing self-harm too it was the culmination of those two but depressive forces but done in an artistic manner so it was just that to me where it's like therapy plus art plus sport plus discipline plus life equals randy myers there you go <laughs> hey, let's go down that road and we'll come back to the wrestling in a bit here one thing that i've always been impressed with you is you have been open about mental health and you've talked out loud about things and even with our chats over the last few months in preparing for this both you and i we've said hey this is not a good mental health day or those type of things and I always want to make sure that when we have a male guest on the show that we do talk about it because one thing that I've noticed is that men do not talk about mental health. Uh, we don't talk about it. And so whenever we have a chance to, I always want to make sure that the voice gets out there and it's okay to talk about what you're going through. And, and that's one thing I've always been impressed with you, Randy. Now, Going with the question there is that as you've been going through, you talked about grief and you've talked about issues. What is mental health to you? What does a good day look to you? Where are you at in identifying good days versus bad days? Oh, okay. That's a good, really good question. And there's, there's, and this is free therapy. Yeah, exactly. A good day for me is basically just a day where I can have peace and solace. Uh, a day where like, I have a lot of intrusive thoughts and anxiety. So a day where I can beat them to the punch. I find normally like really focusing on my diet, making sure about my sleep hygiene is really taken care of, waking up at the right time, routine, making sure I'm eating uh, well in the morning and then getting out and I find my mornings are full of anxiety for me. So if I can get a workout in right away and have an outlet for that, all those bouncy balls that are going a million miles an hour in my head and in my heart and give them kind of a place to be and you expel their energy, then I find that that normally sets me off to a good day. I also love to do something creative. If I'm in a, like my best day, my best day is going to involve me having some sort of art project or some sort of way of expressing myself and able to share that positive energy that I'm feeling or express it to the world. A lot of similarities. Everybody's on their journey and everybody's mental health are in different ways. I'm the same way when it comes to having that workout or something, that energy. For me, it's anxiety. And so I have three triggers. If one trigger happens, I'm okay. If two triggers happen, three triggers happen, the adrenaline overruns my nervous system and it's the fight or flight and it doesn't go away. And I've been trapped in that for months where it's just pumping through the system. But now I've got it under control with quotation marks in a way yeah, yeah. because of, like you said, diet, sleep, 
making sure you're active in the morning whenever you can, those type of things. And it's a struggle. It's the good fight. It's the great fight that we do. Totally. And, and so it comes to this thing here, wrestling matches finish at 10 o'clock. Thankfully, especially here in Western Canada, there are many more women who are part of, of the shows. So it's not just the old boys group that get together. Is it a rambunctious crowd after the fights are over? Is the expectation that you're to go out to the bars and to drink and get home at three, four o'clock in the morning? Is that still the idea? I think that there's, I think there's just different pockets now. I think there's definitely people that are going like that use it as a way, as a way to party or an excuse. Everyone's together. It's celebratory, especially after you have that adrenaline pumping and stuff like that. There's definitely people that like to indulge in some alcoholic beverages or party a little bit afterwards and stay out till all break of dawn or whatever. I normally use that as a time to cheat on my diet. I will probably buy some sort of licorice or maybe like a bag of chips or something like that. And that's, yeah, I really crazy. I really go all out. So I personally don't, I've done that kind of, but to me, I try and lay as much as I can in the ring. So afterwards I spent, there's that old thing that you don't want to be with a boxer because they like the, sexually, they'll just leave it all in the ring and they don't have anything for the bedroom anymore. Old bad stereotype, but I am that stereotype when it comes to wrestling afterwards, because it's such an um, emotional exhibition. It's such a physical thing that I'm just spent. I've built up so much in my own anxiety up to the show. And after that moment of like that, building to that culmination and that climactic burst, I'm just like, I'm done. So basically my ideal time after wrestling is give a big hug to the person I work with, hang out for a little bit, make some jokes, maybe grab some food with the wrestlers afterwards, and then go home and sleep with a smile on my face. You're based in Vancouver, I believe at the moment, and it had been a long time since you had been in Alberta wrestling, but you came back last October for the first love wrestling show put on yeah. by Spencer Love. And you are on the agenda or you are on the promo posters for the upcoming event that's taking place this week because it is a return for the love wrestling show and you are to be on it. So what's it like coming back to Edmonton to wrestle after all these years? At first I was nervous, like I hadn't been there in so long. I'm, Spencer is fantastic and I was working with MRB that night. So those two things I wasn't nervous about. I knew that Spencer was, even though it was his first show, I'd been talking to him for like a couple of years in advance to this. And I knew he was like, had his head in the game and was like, going to put his heart into it. That there would, being that it's anyone's first show, there would be hiccups. But when you've got that kind of heart behind it, those hiccups will be covered up with love. So that was no pun intended. It'll take it, whatever. And then MRB is such a phenomenal talent that I've worked with so much over the years and haven't wrestled him in forever, but I knew I was in good hands there as well, but I wasn't sure how I would be, how I would be perceived by the audience. I wasn't sure what kind of audience would be bought in by the love wrestling. I figured that name was probably a good thing to bring in the right type of people or my right kind of people, but I wasn't exactly sure. And then it was like, so I was very nervous, but it ended up being such a fun night that, and I was so well received that it just made me want to continue to like, I don't know, see where I can take that and see what kind of stuff I can do in being from Calgary, which like Calgary and Edmonton, or like whatever oh, rivalry yeah. stuff, wrestling rivalry stuff. So I've only ever gone up to Edmonton basically to spend a lot of time there basically for wrestling. So I haven't ever been able to be part of any community that was outside of the community of the car that drove up from Calgary and hung out with the wrestlers before the show. So I never really got a lay of the land. I'd done a little bit of, I'd hung out at the fringe a couple of times and stuff like that. I knew there was some like cool art stuff. So yeah, I wasn't exactly sure how I'd be perceived, but going out there and being so well received and I'm really excited to see where we can take love wrestling and what will happen at this next show, which is titled, I don't want to grow up, which is true. It yes. Does. And it's perfect wrestling poster for it too. Beautiful. I do love it. It's just witty and it's strong for people who are not into independent wrestling or the wrestling industry. MRB, Michael Richard Blaze, well-known wrestler, 
perhaps one of the best wrestlers who have ever could be from Alberta. And we'll, we can go back and talk about the Chucky Blaze time too, if we want to later on for him. But to find more information about this week's Love Wrestling Show, do look up Love Wrestling on Facebook. Spencer has a fantastic podcast series with many different topics, but you'll also find information about the show, tickets, where it's at, etc. And a fuller show than what we know of at this point when it comes to the actual card itself. Now, Randy, you were talking about reception coming back, and it's important because we have to give a little bit of backstory here. I lived overseas for a number of years. And when I returned in the early 2000s, a friend of mine took me out to a PWA show, Prairie Wrestling Alliance, run by Kurt Sorokin, who's been in the industry for many years. It was like, yeah, independent wrestling. This is great. A stampede wrestling type feel to it. And on that card was <clears throat> a younger Randy Myers. <laughs> early stages of his career and blossomed. here's this character who's blossomed into a legend <laughs> and but you were on that card with a brother mm. and i put that in quotation marks at that time because it was a tag team of myers brothers but you're on this card and you can see the development of this character of the weirdo hero ravenous randy myers Huge mohawk, all of that type of stuff here as well. Now, didn't know anything about how you identified or anything of that, but there was elements where us gay guys in the crowd can go, well, there's, there could be something up here with this Myers kid. There could be something. I know that since you've been to Vancouver, your character has gone in a certain direction as well more outspoken, more out there. Was this just a natural evolution of your character or did you feel that you could not fully express yourself in the Alberta wrestling scene like you are now wrestling on the West Coast? I would say both. I would say that there was definitely like a natural evolution that partially that came just with doing wrestling for as long as I have, you just like your character can naturally evolve, taking on different characteristics here and there and like shedding that original skin that I talked about. Like I, my brown hair slowly went away. And then the, like you said, I all of a sudden have a, I've got a mohawk, I've got colored hair. I'm starting to show more and more of my true colors as the years go on and as the matches go on. Then yeah, there was, but there was hesitancy as well about being completely openly myself. I was already feeling a bit of a pushback that I had to play always the heel character or the bad guy character because I was different outsider was at that time in wrestling always going to play the bad character and by no means did i want to do another stereotypical gay wrestling character which was the bad guy which was seen as the plague which was seen as the worst thing possible i didn't think that at that point i didn't what wasn't a fight i wanted to have on the daily with promoters or whatever or trying to have them come around to being maybe more progressive than they were at that time or then crowds would be willing to be at that time especially doing a lot of like small town Alberta stuff in general, where those would already be the heckles I was getting from fans, not even playing a character or not even playing up or trying to hide those sides of my, and those would still be the heckles I hear from the fans. And those were biting just like they were biting all through every time I, I, when I was, uh, any time when I was trying to hide who I was. So yeah, it was more finding places that I felt more comfortable. Also the climate changing as well, which is awesome. You know what I mean? More people taking the stand and more being open about who they are and more people being accepting and more people just, just being, yeah, like I said, the more open arms to the way people are and more love, which I accept and I'll take. So it was more, that kind of a big part of it too. I remember going down to WWE audition in 2009, which we can get into the, that, the good of that or not. But one of the things that was a huge takeaway was like Dusty Rhodes was there working with us hand in hand to do promos and stuff like that. And other times people had seen my feminine side and thought that maybe I should use that as a heel tactic or want to exploit that in me. And I was always refused to do that or go against that. But then Dusty saw it as like a positive. And Dusty talked about how he saw this in me 
and called me, he kind of read me a little bit, but in a positive way. And that was the first time I said, this is Dusty Rhodes. This is at a WWE audition. He's telling the other 70 people in the class that they need to be more gay. Or they're like, look, this is going to be like, they're like, that this is good. Like this about him is something that he sees as special. And that like, it's still, you know, I wouldn't say that I came home and was more, my character changed that minute. But that was like the seed that was planted in me. And I'll never be able to be like, I'm so grateful because of that. And I'll never be able to thank or Dusty for that rest of the piece, like enough. So that means a lot. And that was, I'd say a big turning moment for me. Now here's another therapy moment here. And we've never talked about this here. We became big fans of going to the shows and it's a great time and it's energy, right? Now, Century Casino is a place where you all had to wrestle here in Edmonton for a while. And yeah, wrestling there or watching shows there was interesting, but I, this is late 2000s. So the, around the time when you went down to Florida for the auditions, but I remember a couple of shows in a row when I could see you actually really hearing the fans and I could see frustration in you a little bit because I can't remember if you were a face, a good guy at the time, but people were booing. And I just, I, I, you could just see it that you were just conflicted and you were just really struggling with, ah, here's a character, but here's me. And where do they separate? And mm -hmm. at that time, and so I could see it because of course, myself having to deal with the outer face of myself and the inner self, that's when I'm like, I, I can see this. I know something's going on. When was there a time when you were able to go into the ring and go, I am authentically myself. Here is me. Here's this character. And we've completely meshed together. And this is who I am forevermore. I would say the first, my first defined wrestling match. Mm. Uh, I was always taught with to have like I was always very strong about heel versus face, good guy versus bad guy. So the idea of that as wrestling evolved, there was a lot more of these like face versus face, good guy versus good guy style matches uh, where they would like it was more about an athletic contest and stuff like that. Uh, and that was always like hard for me because I'm not don't come from a sports background. The idea of telling the story of good versus evil is much more interesting to me than necessarily like the home team versus the away team or whatever. So I was put into this match and it was like face versus face because that was the new style. That's like what where so much more would come to. And I have luckily evolved. But I went into that match with the mentality like I'm going to play. I'm going to do something. I'm going to. I'm in a new market. I'm in Seattle, a place I've never wrestled before. I went to a Defy show had it as a fan and had a great, fantastic time. And then was fortunate enough to get booked to do a show right after that. And so I was booked in this face versus face match. Went out and I'm like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play. I'm going to give my, a little bit more feminine side. I'm going to do that because I assumed that they were going to, and this is bad on my part, I assumed that they would take that as the heel side. And maybe like, yeah. bully me just as how I'd always been bullied for this. So I'm like, fine, you know, I'll go out there and I'll do this. Just And then they were so sweet and embracing and show me love that I'd never seen before. I was not a heel that night at all. I unfortunately turned the person I was wrestling with heel just by me being so uh, authentic. And I don't think it was even so much as coming from a negative place. It was just coming from that place of where I've always been this i've always been bullied for this so i'm going to show you this as much as i possibly can and i'm sure you're going to hate me for it and then i went out there came out to edit james and i just <laughs> yeah i just no i'm not gonna I'm, if i'm doing this i'm doing this and then i'm going to be 100 percent. and then floated myself to the ring let the song just encompass me and didn't care and then they like i said they saw the authenticity in that they saw uh, the opposite, I think, of what you were saying of that frustration that you were seeing of like the clash of character where this doesn't quite feel like it fits or something's off. I think they saw the opposite of that. I think they saw something that was truly on and truly whole. And from that moment on, there was no looking back. 
And Defy Wrestling is a relative recent organization uh, based in the United States and doing quite well. They're building a name for themselves. So this authenticity is relatively recent in comparison. And to give some background story to this as well, they bring in a lot of recognizable names and faces. And then all of a sudden, the weirdo hero, ravenous Randy Myers, is in a championship match. And he wins the championship. And what happened? Who else joined you in the ring after you won your title? Every single person in that building. Basically, we invited the fans, or I invited the fans into the ring. We all celebrated together. And it was like that moment in ECW where all, all the fans are in the ring, or even when they threw the chairs in. It's so one of those super memorable moments. I got to share it with them. They were the ones who brought this new version of me out. This big. I was on the verge of hanging up my boots before I went to Defy, that first Defy show. And out of frustration, out of not feeling fully satisfied with where I was at. And then after that, falling in love with Defy, having Defy fall in love with me, having it all culminate in that moment where we're all in the ring was so beautiful. It was like anarchy. We were all in there together. And then we heard this ring start to squeak. And then I'm like, everyone needs to exit the ring at this point. And then everyone lovely got out of the ring. And it was just so cool how we could be, go from that, like, such intensity, but then such unity, like ants almost, where we're like, nope, well, we don't want to wreck anything. And then that was, then COVID struck. Yeah, and, then, and that's the big thing about you. How do you continue on in many ways? Because you've had two instances in your career where you were not going to be that independent secret wrestler that we all love. You had two opportunities to really get out there. One of it's Defy being their champion and then COVID strikes and you can't get back over the border to go into the United States again. This has to be frustrating to you. It's one of the worst things, honestly. It's super, super depressing. It's been hard. It's been really hard. I struggle for me, definitely. I miss it beyond words and have so much like unfinished business. And I feel like my husband's away at war. Basically is what I feel like. Uh, while the gyms were closed, I felt like my husband's away at war and I was training in my cold basement. So I felt every day and every night I'm still preparing for when my husband returns. So I'm training in my cold basement. I felt I was like shaving my box every night for my husband to come home and he wasn't coming home and it's just getting more and more raw and I don't have a good razor and I'm in the Wendy's bathroom and it using the soap and it just my husband to come home I miss you and I'm sore and I'm raw one of my good friends Sue Oguchi always listens to the podcast while driving her car and I'm just imagining Sue is pulling over to the side of the road right now just because she's killing herself laughing so, Sue, make sure that you're in a safe spot here. Be careful. And always use a good razor. That's what I've learned. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, oh, wow. you know, it, is there hope coming soon that you're going to be able to get across the border again? Or is we're, this something that we just don't know about? Yeah, we're like laying, laying in Lady Limbo right now. I'm hoping there's obviously things are in motion to get me down there as soon as uh zombies possible but i can't i'm not can't quite talk about anything yet but we've yeah. got things in motion and hopefully oh i i i can't give up hope it's you, you can't i can't i don't i'm not ready for a heel turn yet i've got still too much fight in me and yeah so there's still like wrestling starting to pop up here in vancouver i'm doing the love wrestling show coming up or i'll be at least making an appearance so yeah, there's lots of stuff on the horizon i've really taken to doing stand-up during this time so yeah, I mean, like, well, that's where I like, it was something I've always wanted to do, but wrestling has always taken my main focus. Like I said, it's something all encompassing. Uh, and if you want to be good at it, you have to give it your all. And during this time off, I had an opportunity to, to go after another dream because I'm wild like that. And I saw an opportunity to maybe get on the stage and start doing some open mics. And I've always had some, I've always had a calling for that. And so now I'm at my 98th set and I've been doing it. Yeah, stand up for the last two years and it's been really a great experience to meet new minds new different style of creative minds see how 
they're similar, like how wrestling and comedy are similar, and then to see how they're so vastly different at the same time. But also it's, again, lately I've been saying it's misfits. Again, then back to that, but I've been thinking lately, like we can't all be misfits because then we're not misfits. You know what I mean? Like it, we're all, and that's what I'm realizing. It's like this camaraderie between the people who want to live alternative lifestyles or just have it, don't even want to. They can't help it. It's just inside of them. It's part of it. Yeah. So with that, in the wrestling ring, you, I imagine you learn how to build up the crowd and then bring them down again. And then you bring them up to that climatic finish, you hope. Can you take that and put that into stand-up comedy? Or is it a completely different beast in itself where you had to play the crowd in the way that you're performing? I would say, I don't know, that's like, like, I've been trying to, like I said, I'm still like two years in, so I'm still like totally learning the ropes, which is fun because I've been a veteran for something for a while, but to be like at the beginning again is great. But I do find that you can do almost not quite the exact same match structure, but I definitely know how to work a crowd and that comes across doing promos over the years and knowing like how to gauge a crowd and how to know what they want and what they don't want comes in play. So there are some crossover elements for sure, but in wrestling, I can hold something up over my head and go, come on. And they'll cheer really loud. If I do that in comedy, they just look at me like I've lost my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you just can't take a chair out and do a chair shot with your random audience members. I guess oh, no. it's not allowed. That's one thing that is I find the most interesting is how something can be allowed in one performance aspect, but not in another performance aspect. I've also done a lot of improv. And I did improv for five years with troops and stuff like that around Vancouver. And I noticed that like, anytime I tried to bring wrestling onto the improv stage, it was like such a no-go. It could be the smallest little kick to the guts or like little something in wrestling we wouldn't blink an eye at. But in front of the theater crowd, they would like gasp and be like so nervous and then come up to you after the show and be like, that thing that happened two hours ago where it looked like you might have kicked him in the stomach, is that, that real? And it's just interesting how. I think that's all kind of part of consent is we allow yeah. this in this avenue, but we don't want that at all in this avenue. So like you said, me bringing out a chair is not going to get a good reaction at a comedy show. But I have found that if I do a big ring announcer voice and announce myself with this big bravado, they will come up. So there are some things that you can take and trade here and there and stuff. And I think it's making me a stronger performer. So I mentioned a few minutes ago about two different opportunities defy was one of them and it still is there and i know you've talked about this before on other places but introducing you to this audience this platform here I have to go back to the night where we were all cheering for you and i believe it was cactus jack mankind mick foley there that night and we're all saying goodbye to ravenous randy myers because he has accepted a contract to work with the WWE, WWF for people who go, oh yeah, okay, and now I know what we're talking about. We all say goodbye to Randy, and then a couple of months later, Randy's back, and nobody talks about it, and then Randy continues wrestling, and we're like, oh, okay, I don't know what's going on, but we're just going to go with it. Randy. You've got this contract. You're going to the United States. You're going to the big time of WWE. What happened? I smoked weed and they busted me for that. At the time, so I did was not expecting. I went down to a WWE tryout in 2009. But when I had mentioned previously with Dusty Rhodes, there was a bunch of people there. Previously mentioned as well, Hannibal was there as well. I didn't expect much from it. I knew that me and Dusty hit it off and promos were going really well. But the in-ring stuff, I don't know if I did, I wasn't sure. I was waiting on my, they're supposed to send a performance review package and I was waiting on my performance review package. And then I got a call saying that they were going to offer me, they wanted to offer me a contract. And I was like gobsmacked as it was, completely gagged. And then I, they told me, they asked if there was gonna be any steroids or any drugs in my system. I told them they'd find weed in my system. They told me that was a $500 fine. Obviously like not a good thing, huge blemish, but it was a $500 fine. And then I'm like, okay. And so they set me up for my drug testing. They set all the paperwork in motion and stuff like that. Being an anxious kid who definitely had a marijuana abuse 
issue at the time. I continued smoking. And then when the test came time, I got popped for marijuana. They called me up and they said, hey, you got popped for marijuana? And I'm like, yeah, that's what I, that's what I said was going to happen. And then they were like, sorry, kiddo, you got So then I got, yeah, they were layered. They were like, no, I believe the line was spoken. Who do you think you are, Randy Orton? I'm not saying that I said that line, but I'm not. <laughs> and, and then, yeah, and then that was obviously it was just as much as that moment getting the first call hit me. That second one hit me just as hard too. I was beside myself. Like we said, I'd already done this tour. Not only had I gone to Edmonton, I'd gone out to Vancouver. I'd done Calgary. I'd done Winnipeg. I'd done my little goodbye tour or whatever, like articles in the newspaper, all that blah, blah, stuff. You know what I mean? Here it is. I'd been wrestling at that point nine years. And it was like, oh, I've done this. Mick Foley's my idol. My last match, with, you mentioned being in the ring with Cactus Jack. He's by like ultimate, like my number one always will be and is the biggest teddy bear in the world. So that was like my ultimate send off. And then I had to think, okay, do I just quit wrestling now? It's do I just put my tail between my legs? And I did reach the point where I was in the ring with my hero. And luckily enough, everyone was like, okay, we're just willing to eat this and let Randy come back and not say anything. Not one person asked questions. They were just like, legitimately, no one asked me anything. There's like, which I accepted and then we rolled with it. And I think I wrestled with PWA for another three years, I want to say, and then moved out to Vancouver to continue my wrestling career here. Like PWA was totally like embracing to me both leaving and then not leaving, which is was like, I don't know whether if everyone was questioning me or if there was like, why didn't you go Randy Chance or something like that? Or like signs. Mm -hmm whether or like how hard that would have hit. So the fact that people were just willing to be accepting, there was definitely at that time, I wasn't nowadays, marijuana is totally different than it was then at that time. Now, when I tell people that story, they're like, weed, what the, what, 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 yeah. what are you talking about? Like, not really? But then people yeah. were like, how dare you do that? How dare you do that? What were you thinking? Which I get things change and I'm not blaming them or blaming, I'm uh, just saying mm -hmm. the facts, but it's funny how time changes. And but looking back, I'm so glad with my life the way it is. WWE, we all know it's that major corporation. It's I don't know whether I would have ever been able to have been my full self. Got into the place I got to yeah. now. Met the people I've met now. After that, I got to, I kept training. I kept training people out of Cal. I moved out here with Alex Plexus and Andy Bird, who were two of my best friends. I met Andy after that. So I've met so many people in my life doing the stand-up thing now. Um, living in Vancouver, it's kind of everything I've wanted the defy thing. I was always an ECW fan above all else. It was that independent, the biggest independent promotion and that punk rock kind of gritty attitude of this is built on the fans love for what this is. And that's what defy has. And as much as I would love to have been able to give my mom the house, I would have bought her from WWE money. I'm happy with the home that I built within defy. And that's why I wanted to bring it up because sure on one level you can go, oh, it was a failure and that's the way it was. But looking at yourself and your career, it's not a failure. You've built and you've strong and you've created this name, this niche for yourself. I, I agree with you. I don't think you could have been your authentic self and being your authentic self is so much more important than having every person alive know your name. And so things are meant to be that way but there's one thing that you have to do for me for the next year out sports recently released the top 200 wrestlers recently and randy you are ranked far too low or far too high no far too low on that list mm -mm. why the heck you should have been far higher than that my friend yeah, I agree. I agree. But I don't think, I think I would, might have been on who was getting the most matches as well. But in the last couple of years, some people in the States have been able to have lots of matches. And mm -hmm. I've been like, as we said, in my basement, shaving. <laughs> <laughs> but so I don't blame anyone. I was just honored to honestly be on that list. I think it was 81 or something like that. It wasn't too bad. I thought it was okay. Yeah, you had a great number. And mm -hmm. the fact that we're at a spot right now where out sports can do 200 wrestlers yeah. that was stunning to me beforehand i was counting oh there's yourself leo london a couple of the other people that were out with the wwe 
And then I'm going through the list and going, there's this gay wrestling promotion. There's another gay wrestling promotion. And then it was like, how many gay wrestling promotions are there here in yeah. North America? How did that happen? Where was I sleeping? What the heck? I, I know. So many, right? Not enough in Canada, I'll say. But there's a lot. Yeah, I was just stunned going through that. And so where for people who were thinking of wrestling as just being this macho sport, which it is, there's the elements of it there. The gay community definitely goes towards it. And I remember a moment about 10 years ago, we were at a show and one of my straight friends was there and they said, oh, Doug, you're only here watching it because they're half dressed, they're half naked. And I was like, oh yeah. They were half naked. <laughs> they didn't even make a connection. I, mean, I was like, oh yeah, I guess they are. Because you get caught up in it in so many different ways. And yeah. that's important. And we're coming to the end of our time here together, Randy. Just because life, and I know you'll be back for others things. Because there's lots of stuff that we've got planned. And once again, everybody, another person to be smitten with. Randy, how can people find out more about you? when it comes to Instagram or social media. Totally. Uh, you can find me at the Weirdo Hero, at the Weirdo Hero on Instagram or at Ravenous Randy on Twitter. Uh, those are probably the two best places to find my stuff. Trying to do as much wrestling stuff as possible. You can if you want to add me on Facebook, you can do that if you're old or young or whatever. I don't know, probably <laughs> not. But yeah, you can find me easily enough and I always put all my stuff out there like I always be putting up my shows on Instagram, whatever shows coming up. Like you said the Love Wrestling one is just around the corner. I'm also doing a comedy show Peter Grant and Friends here in Vancouver at the Motten on the 22nd so tomorrow yeah yeah something yeah it would be tomorrow yeah. uh for you because yeah. we're taping ahead so that's why we are like looking at ourselves going what week are we tomorrow. talking about at the moment tomorrow. exactly so yeah we're trying i'll make sure that i put the links for that as well when we put this uh, out to everybody um, you were talking peter brown big brother canada uh, yeah, oh, this the Peter Grant was the guy, but Peter Brown I have worked with as well. Peter Grant okay. is the one who it is. But yeah, I do know Peter Brown. Uh, he worked with ECCW, and he was from Big Brother, yeah. so Okay, yeah. these are yeah, the weird things. So I apologize to Peter Grant. I'm sure you're a wonderful, famous, infamous person as well. He's delightful. All the way, that's just a shout out to most Peters. So let's just, to all those Peters out there. <laughs> this has now turned into an episode of Rumper Room, where we see all the Peters <laughs> of the world. I see your Peter. Oh wait, no, that's not okay. No, no, that doesn't. That could work with the shading, no. but yeah, that no. is Tales of the Two S LGBTQ Plus After Dark, which will be appearing <laughs> another time. Hey, Randy, I could talk about wrestling with you for a long time because independent wrestling is a lot of fun and there's a cast of characters that come along the way whether it's one show or for many shows can you give a shout out to some of the people who have been influential in your life in the wrestling industry and just shout them out and just with that thanks and saying hey i see you oh, cool i would say for sure number one is a tyson kid tj wilson tj wilson taught me so much not only in the ring but like discipline for trip for working out as well as just took me under his wing as like a friend and was there for me and always stuck up for me and got me bookings and was there for me when I needed a shoulder to cry on as well. So I can never say enough good things about him. He's the, one of the greatest souls on the face of the planet. Ross Hart actually refused to let me wrestle at Stampede Wrestling unless I graduated high school and he's a high school teacher. So he got me my high school diploma and got me my job with Stampede Wrestling. So I can't, like, he's a phenomenal yeah. human being as well. Natalia beat the whole high, holy crap out of me on a daily basis. And I'll never be more grateful for that, for being so kind while kicking my ass and just watching her live her dreams and be so humble and sweet while doing it is phenomenal and so inspiring i would say who else would who else do i want to throw out i want to yeah the people down at defy for sure jim perry and matt farmer who are the two promoters down there as well as annie and they're fantastic people who saw something in me that saw that there was more after even 
17 years, 16 years in this business, that there was still more to put in that that could come out of it. I want to thank that Bruce Hart for teaching me, for taking me into the dungeon. Uh, the story uh, was I went to Ted Arch Pro Wrestling Camp. I spent all my money there. I didn't have money to go to the dungeon once time came around. But Bruce was willing to let me pay with my soul, but more so with my hide. I was like the bump dummy for everyone. So he let me basically, if I was willing to take suplex after suplex, train in the dungeon for free, which is like the greatest gift and maybe a big part of who I am today. I could go on forever and ever. I would last, I would say like last, I would say to Dusty Rhodes for really seeing who I was and Mick Foley, of course, for being that hero, they always say you don't meet your heroes, but he's that hero. I just say, hey, make sure your hero is Mick Foley and then beat him all the time because he's the best. And then my mom, Julie Francon, couldn't be here without her. Wouldn't be the wrestler I am, wouldn't be the human, wouldn't be the lovely member of the rainbow community and be as willing to be as out there and outlandish as I am without her. So that's where I stand. Big shout out to Julie Francon. She can do five push ups now. Oh, that's more than I can. So, yeah, these are not pipes. The, this, mm. the, this is Doritos Cool Ranch, and this is barbecue. Ooh, lovely. Yeah, I just got turned on by my own arm as I imagined my own <laughs> chips there. That's a, such so, a good tattoo, a Dorito, though, right? Man, that's pretty tough. Oh, oh, I am a stocky soul. I <laughs> am portly. I used to be a lot more in shape and all that, but... The wonderful part of being stocky is every once in a while you can find a stray chip that's been that's found in a fold. Oh, <laughs> it's wonderful. So yeah, definitely. Uh, it's got that like baked in like sweaty goodness, what human oil goodness. Oh, oh, how we changed this interview from this wonderful ending where you're thanking people and now we've grossed people out. Yay! Um, that's, what do. That's, that's what it is. Randy. Thank you for this. Thank I've been looking much. forward to this chat for a long time, and it was everything that I hoped it would be, and so much more. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm glad it turned out. I'm glad we made this work because it was super fun for me, too. And I'm excited to meet all these new people, too. Yeah, Thanks for exactly. Doing thank, you for, thank you for having this podcast and for introducing people and for making these voices and these stories heard because it's important, especially within uh, Alberta. So I hear that and I see you for that. Thank you. Randy. You are the nicest person out there. I thought that's what I was going for. Yeah, you, you got that. That was part of the award that we just gave you. <laughs> so everybody, Randy is returning to Alberta this weekend. Love wrestling. He has been promoted for this card. We can't say anymore. <laughs> We're good, Spencer. We're good. And so make sure that you go out. Check Love Wrestling on Facebook. Check for the tickets. I know I'm going to be there. Come say hi to me. That's for sure. All that good stuff. Randy also made mention of a stand-up comedy show that he'll be at. We'll make sure that we put all of that advertising out there as well. So if you're in the Vancouver area, do check. Love Wrestling's here in Edmonton. Randy's going to be back many more times as well. For sure. On behalf of the weirdo hero, ravenous Randy Myers, my name is Douglas Parsons. I want to thank all of you for listening to this episode of Tales of the 2S LGBTQ+. Please make sure you press subscribe. Leave us a really good star rating, a good review. Word of mouth is great. Send links, all that good stuff. I'm here now to remind you to be good and always text when you get home. Until next time, everybody. <laughs>